to talk Thanks, a, bit, a bit about what you guys are working on now and especially about the 90s because that's the focus of the show. And that's okay. where you, you guys came out of the 90s. And I remember them being a big deal about you guys being a blues act, and, but, but not like your typical blues act. Definitely. Yeah, uh, I guess we were kind of a twist on that. We were, uh, in those days, there used to be, and I guess there still is, the term blues rock. Yeah. Uh, and so we were slotted into that pretty early on. And, uh, and that's okay, because we, we do like blues and rock. And so I guess we could be blues rock. I really think there's even a bit of a funk element to some of your songs, especially in the rhythm sections. So I really love your sense of melody. It really comes across to me. Very astute observations. Thank you for observing those. Yeah, the mel my favorite, one of my favorite melodies is in the bridge of Sugarcane. Oh yeah, nice. I, just, I love how it builds up into the climactic ending of the song. So I think it's a great, great melody. Um, and then I a couple appreciate others. That. Thank you. A couple other songs I was going to touch on too that I thought were really great was I Love Not Loving You. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, our, our dark, our child that didn't get, that people didn't pay much attention to, but yeah, I think it's a, it's secretly a banger. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> and Half a Chance. Also. Yeah, good. another one. Yeah. But thank those, you. But those th three songs together really drew my attention to your sense of melody because I feel melody is really lacking in, in some music today. I don't think there's as much focus on it anymore. I agree. So yeah, I think I think the, all the parts of sort of songwriting, songwriting is a skill and it's a it's craft, and you hone it over the course of decades. And you know, the the best songwriters I've ever come across, whether in real life or or just and you know, hearing about what they'd say when they talked about songwriting, all said, you, you know, you probably haven't written a good song till you've written your thousandth song. You know, like it takes a long time to write a good song that checks all the boxes that delivers in terms of melodically, in terms of movement throughout, in terms of a beginning, middle and end, in terms of uh, tension and release, all the stuff, all the, the tricks of the trade. I've always believed it is more difficult to write that uh, big commercial hit than it is oh, anything yeah. else. But uh, there's bands that are really good at doing it and then they get like treated like garbage for doing it such as Nickelback you know what I mean yeah. <laughs> so yeah I think it's because you know I think those bands and I I know those guys we've we've toured together before they're lovely people mm -hmm. and so I'm not like I I'm not on I'm not in the camp that criticize them I yeah. in fact I'm happy for them that they've done what they've done mm -hmm. but I think the reason why they get criticized and there's two reasons why they get criticized the way they do unfairly I think one is just like the haters syndrome right? like if you get to the top people are going to hate on you they want to bring um, you down yeah i want to bring you down and and they want to not be seen as like liking the most popular thing that's out there so that's one reason and then the other reason i think is is because it they felt people who critique them you know the common thread often was every it's like a cookie cutter right like every song and I mean, to, but to be fair, it's like, well, they figured out something that worked for them and that really fit what they were and it was highly successful for them. So I kind of get why they would, why they would do it again and again. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that it's funny that the same people who trash Nickelback love ACDC when I don't see the difference. <laughs> I've all, we've also toured with them. And that's true. I will say this. I didn't, I didn't fully get, I, didn't, I don't think I even partially got ACDC until we toured with them. Mm -hmm. And then about the, I would say maybe the third or fourth show in, after watching it and taking in the whole arena rock concert, I was like, oh, I, all of a sudden it clicks. This is, these, this is built for arena rock. This is built to be in an arena with a bunch of people wearing horns doing this. Yeah head head banging right it's like it's this is perfect for that it's built for that and it does it exceptionally well and after that i was like i started digging all a whole bunch of songs that i never thought i would dig it's true and i that was going to come up here eventually is the fact that you guys have had one thing i've always known about you you've one of the bands that probably traveled this country more than anyone and you've had so many amazing opportunities to play with huge acts like ZZ Top, 
ACDC. Didn't you even play with the Stones? Yeah, we did five shows with the Stones, two during their Bridges to Babylon tour and three during their, maybe the other way around, three during Bridges to Babylon, two during No Security tour. Now, how do you get these shows? Is it, is it good management? What's the secret? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say it's not good management. Um, I'm going to say it's, uh, I don't know. I think there's a bit of luck involved. I think there's um, being in the right place at the right time, being flexible and, you know, being fortunate enough to have like certain connections that just happen to line up. Like the ACDC thing, we had the same business managers as ACDC mm-hmm. and uh, Slash and his band were supposed to be opening that tour and then like last second had to pull out and so they were scrambling and our business manager said hey what about these guys that we know and they said sure let's try them so they gave us kind of like a, a, a test run of three shows and it went well and so then we did like 22 dates with them the ZZ Top ones I think were more we toured with them twice two different runs the first one was probably due to our agents and maybe our label, maybe management a bit. And the second one was because we had done the first one with them and they were looking for someone and our agents kind of put our hands up for us. So yeah, I guess it's just, yeah, certain connections, but it's also a bit of luck because, you know, they can pick whoever they want to come and play with them. That is true. And it's the fact that you guys make such great music too. And you're, you're uh, fantastic. I appreciate that. Thank you so now, much. Tell me about the reissue of Stew on Vinyl right now. Are you yourself a vinyl collector? Uh, I have a very small vinyl collection, and that's mostly by, by, as a result of me starting one and then having little kids and realizing that um, the fragility of vinyl and the space that it takes up wasn't conducive to having two little kids doing what two little kids do. True. So I'm, my vinyl collection uh, kind of stalled. Um, but I think I, f- I feel like my kids are old enough and I can start, I can get back on that train. Um, and the reason why Stu has come out on vinyl is because it is its 20th anniversary. We've, for the past, I'm going to say 10 years, we've had fans reach out to us saying, hey, can you, none of your back catalogs on vinyl. There's a lot of people collecting vinyl these days, listening on vinyl. So, you know, it, it makes sense that some of those were our fans. And they kept asking for it. And we don't have the rights to the early part of our catalog. It's, um, it's Warner's. So we kept trying to arrange it. But honestly, like all the hoops you have to jump through to make that happen are, are laborious. Like it's, it, yeah. it, it's lots of time. It's other people kind of coming to the party and putting their time and effort in as well. It's, it's redoing a bunch of stuff that you wouldn't have, that you didn't think of when you did it in the first place. Like, we didn't master any of those um, albums to be pressed to vinyl. You got to master it in a different way. Um, Mm -hmm. We didn't make the album artwork to be put on vinyl. We made it for CDs, which it sounds like, well, it's kind of the same thing, but it's not, Um, you know, you don't have the, the little insert part of the, of the lay of the vinyl that has something on it. We didn't have, you know, we didn't, hadn't contemplated that even. So anytime we'd like start to do, try to get some movement on on reissuing back catalog and vinyl something else would come up either other shows we'd get involved in our lives in general uh making new records whatever it was Mm -hmm. so it just it's kind of like i guess there's maybe that's a silver lining to my COVID experience is that it it gave me the time like we couldn't do any shows so we were like okay well let's focus back on records and and we realized that it was a 20th anniversary of Stu, and we also um, hadn't forgotten, but we were reminded that that we, we that people want to hear our stuff in vinyl. So we were like, okay, we can do this. We have a window here to really focus on this. And Warner stepped up, and uh, and there you go. Now we have vinyl of Stu. So it's good that everybody knows that. We're going to spread the word that you can get your hands on a copy of it. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention is I really like the old time artwork on the cover of the album you put out last year. I want to go with you. Um, I felt yeah. that was one of the bluesiest albums you've done yet. So yeah, that- I feel, I feel the same as you. It's, uh, I think it's hands down the bluesiest album we've done. And that was, that was on purpose. We, you know, we've been writing songs and 
doing various um, stints in, in studios, demoing stuff up um, with an eye towards making the next, whatever the next album was going to be. And so Sean had spent probably the last three or four years prior to releasing that album, really honing this, this guitar technique he'd come up with where he puts three um, slides on his left hand and plays lap steel. Um, and he'd been playing slide guitar for a long time and he, he even started experimenting really strongly with that, especially in the Stu era actually. Um, but he came up with this technique, which was really unique and allowed him different voicings and kind of made his brain work musically in a different way than it had before. Mm -hmm. And there was sort of a collection of songs or embryos of songs that came out of him honing that skill. And, and as we were demoing stuff, we started to realize that there's a group of songs here that are, are potentially make up the bulk of what could be an, an album of songs that really sit well together. And ultimately that became the album I want to go with you. And we filled it out with a few others through a cover in there. Hmm. Um, and yeah, it was like, you know, polar opposite of the approach to Stu. Stu was a really produced and thought out and um, layered, um, you know, multifaceted sort of layers of multi-tracking different instruments, voicings. We'd never use instruments. We'd never use. There was a string section in a song. There were keyboards everywhere. Mm. Um, there was a horn here and there. Um, so, you know, that was Stu, but, but I want to go with you as the opposite where we just went in and didn't even have fully sketched out ideas in some cases of the songs and just played and recorded the first few takes and, and then sat and listened to see if we caught anything. And sure enough, we did, I guess, you know, we've been playing together since we were 10 years old. So you're bound to catch something if you just put the two of us in a room. Which method of making an album was more satisfying to you? Oh, man, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know. I, I love I love the the randomness and spontaneity of of just get in there and see what happens. And there's just also a certain I guess there's a kind of pressure that comes with that of like, hopefully something good comes of this. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, there's also like a fun pressure of, I know exactly what I need to do because we've mapped out this song right down to every little drum fill. And so I have to get all of those right. Mm. So I enjoy that pressure as well. Um, I, sh I don't know which I like better. I think, I think they're both, doing it both ways was important for us to have, um, just have experience because that's, yeah, that's part of our growth and part of our, our you know, toolbox now. And, and I think you learn from as many different ways you can do things. You learn something new from all of those. And so, oh yeah, yeah maybe we'll find a new way to do the next album. That's a good idea, right? Yeah, yeah. Let keep, me, anyone who, anyone who has learning. any ideas, shoot them at us. <laughs> um, do you have any scandalous stories from back when you guys were young and having fun on tour and it was the beginning of everything? <laughs> Were you bad? What were you oh, doing? Oh man. Okay, I, I will say this. Honestly, I'm being I'm being dead serious. I think relative to what I had seen going on around us, and just like kind of the rumor mill, I think we were pretty good. Like I think, um, I think we were pretty good. Like maybe the worst thing you could say was sometimes I was a bit curmudgeonly, um, but like I don't think we were. I don't think we were like particularly mean or insensitive to anyone. I don't think we were like, I wouldn't categorize any of our behavior as, uh, as over the line in any way. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, maybe there were nights here and there where someone partied a bit too hard, but to my recollection, nothing got so out of hand that like, you know, police or anything like that had to be yeah. involved. So I feel okay about it. Yeah, we I all think. we all party from time to time. That's just how it yeah, is. Yeah, you got to you got to let go yeah. a little bit. That's true, that's yeah. true. But um, it's funny because most of the bands I talked to were like, "No, we were pretty much just focused on the music." <laughs> <laughs> that's the by like, road. That's oh, the yeah. hockey, it's the equivalent of like doing an an, an interview with a hockey player, right? Oh, we just got to <laughs> go out there and give one hundred and ten percent and just get some shots on the net and. Uh, <laughs> And really work hard and work as a team and stay together. And say a hundred times uh, in a sentence. Uh, yeah, uh, we just got to, uh, <laughs> yeah, we were just uh, focused on the uh, music and uh, yeah, we didn't, there was nothing scandalous. It's true. It's true. Yeah. What country, 
Now you guys have probably gotten a lot of opportunities to tour other countries. Um, what country besides Canada really embraced Wide Mouth Mason? Uh, in a weird way, China really embraced Wide Mouth Mason. We yeah. did a tour of China in like 2002, I want to say. Maybe it was the end of 2001, something like that. Um, and we didn't know what we were going into. Like that was, I think that's like 20 years ago, right? Like who knows? It, it was still not as nearly as modern as what you think of China as today. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I mean, having said that, it was still, you know, a modern country by and large. But like you knew when you went to rural places, it felt very rural. And, uh, and yeah, it was, it was such a strange, it was such a strange feeling to be in this place where like there'd be crowds of people waiting for you. I mean, that wouldn't happen to us here, right? Like where you'd have like people waiting outside the venue for you to show up and with signs and stuff. It's just yeah. such a different scale of everything, right? We'd go and do, we did a TV show there and we asked our guys like, so what, like what kind of viewership does this, does this station have? And he's like, oh, it's only the third biggest one. But, you know, but it, it has a loyal fan base. We're like, oh, that's cool. So how many people are we talking about? He's like, it's, it'll probably reach around 75 million people. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? Just double the population of Canada. No big deal. Third largest. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so what's the largest doing? Oh, geez. I was, I was going to say a billion easy. <laughs> it's crazy it's like oh okay like the scale is just their small cities are they're like we were doing places that were you know in their eyes tertiary markets like smaller cities and they'd be like no three four million and those are like little towns to them mm -hmm. yeah no i mean i think we feel pretty blessed to be here in canada with all this space and oh, all this, man. <laughs> this ability to uh to properly distance from others as well Especially in yeah, that's a very good, someone should do some, uh, some analysis of that, the actual physical space and, and population density or lack thereof, and whether that's contributing to our ability to curtail the, uh, the, the COVID. I'm sure it does to a point. Yeah. Um, what now have you toured in Europe? We have done, we've gone to Europe to play twice. We went, both times we went to something called the Montreux Jazz Festival, which is in Switzerland. Okay. Oh. And um, it's a really cool festival. It's called a jazz festival, but really it covers every bass you can possibly think of. Mm. Like Stones, Rolling Stones have played it. Aretha Franklin played it. Like everybody's played it. Um, and so we got randomly invited there because Sean, our singer, ran into the guy who books that festival. His name was Claude Nobs. He was in the offices of Atlantic Records in New York, right when Sean happened to be in those offices when we had signed our deal with Atlantic. And they met and they got on really well and immediately Claude was like, oh, you should come to our festival. And so, uh, you know, people say things like that, but often that doesn't really mean anything. In this case, it meant something. So we went and played that and we got invited back uh, again a couple of years later and it was just unbelievable. We were, we were so in awe of all of the people playing there that we, we, the first time we had the ability to do this, we went in a week early and just watched like every single show we could see. Mm. We'd, we'd be like running between venues cause we didn't, we wanted to make sure we saw, you know, both Michelle and Degicello and Ziggy Marley and they were playing at the same time. So how are we going to pull that off? And we'd be like just running back and forth. Wow. That must've been a massive festival with a lot of venues. It's there. there so there's two big venues but stuff on it like almost all the time. And it's a two week festival. And then there's something called the Jazz Cafe, which is like a third kind of more, uh, a bit more random sort of a venue, like people get up and jam together. Um, and, then, and then there are a number of smaller like outdoor venues and cafes and stuff, but the, the big ones are in those two main halls, Miles Davis Hall and, and something else hall. Wow. I, uh talked to some of my friends who are in bands who've played in Europe and gone and done festivals and tours. And they said, it's like magical over there to go play for people. People just soak it in and they're so appreciative to, to listen to your original work. It really is. It's, a, it's like, uh, and again, like nobody's heard of us in Switzerland, right? Like who is, they're not there to see us, but they are there to, to hear and experience music. And so I think it was the second time we went there, um, 
you know, it's kind of a, a, a laissez-faire sort of attitude sometimes. So um, Claude was like just kind of getting a sense of the room and he's like, why don't we bring some people here onto the stage with you guys to just sit around and like be really close to, to you guys playing? And we're like, yeah, that's cool with us. Yeah. And so like it really felt like, it felt like something out of the 60s. Like I felt like I was in, you know, a, a, that kind of a vibe with people just sitting a, like right beside me while I'm playing drums and just smiling and like enjoying it and just like you know the it really was a feeling of like just people giving off good vibes oh i love that yeah, um, it was lovely now i noticed that a lot of the venues are starting to open up here in edmonton and allowing live music to happen again um very carefully now do you guys have future gig plans already laid out of what's going to be happening for wide mouth mason at this time yeah so we've um sort of cautiously booked some dates for this i think it's for the summer mm -hmm. um and i think as we as we kind of see what happens with the numbers and um provincial and federal guidelines we'll start looking at doing um closed room venues but right now it's it's solely limited to outdoor festivals um that that will be able to accommodate whatever kind of needs to happen so that's on for sure well, in so much as there is a for sure. Yeah. Um, the, the small rooms, indoor ones, we're still waiting to kind of make sure we're out of the woods before we do that. That still loves, leaves a lot of time for planning for next year because it is, we're, we're in fall now, so we're coming into winter and it's hard to do outdoor shows in Canada in winter. <laughs> I know. So. I, I bet you we could come up with something. I bet you there's guys, there's, yeah. I mean, we've done some really cold outdoor shows in Canada in winter, so. Have you Maybe ever... that's, we did like, once we did this thing for much music had this thing, I think they called it snow job. Does that oh sound right? yes, it was snow job. Yeah. yeah. Whistler, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. I, I think it was Whistler. Yeah, it was Whistler. Or, or they would and move would it around. Like, yeah, maybe they moved it around. I think that was during like February, right? That was during like like maybe February. Anyway, yeah. it was cold and we were on a mountain and like it was snowing and we were playing and that was all right. We've done, uh, we played the Grey Cup several times, which is, I mean, it's kind of in a tent, but really not, it's not in a tent. It's like there's canvas or whatever that tent material is, is up, but it's not like it's warm in there, right? It's like you're yeah. in Winnipeg or something. It's like minus 30. That thing's not going to do anything. It maybe breaks the wind a bit. Maybe it does, but usually there's like little slots in it too. So all I ever recall is just like hoping somehow that it would, you know, by playing, I'd get warm. It's always your fingers. Your fingers just mm. get so cold. So That's so hard for a musician to play. It's like, not cool. And then like trying to keep your guitar that? in tune. Yeah, you, you can't. <laughs> yeah. We would no, like put, hot, you know, remember hot shots? Those things you shake and you stick them in your glove. Yes. You tr we would try that, but it's still like your finger, you need to be able to move your finger so you can't hold on to a hot shot and hold a drum. Hey, maybe you can. Maybe that's a new grip idea. I'm going to go talk to some uh, inventors. I think it's a good plan. Keeps yeah. the dexterity. Pretty limited market. Siberian, Scandinavian, and Canadian drummers, but mm -hmm. there's probably a few of them out there. Did you grow up in Saskatoon as well? Yeah, Sean and I were, uh, we were like, we were classmates and buddies starting when we were nine years old, grade mm -hmm. four, and went through elementary school together, went through high school together, and music was always our, our common bond. And are you guys still based out of Saskatoon? Uh, I go, we both have family there. So we go back pretty regularly, but neither one of us lives there full time anymore. Sean lives in Vancouver and I'm in Toronto. Okay. It seems like a lot of uh, similarities, I think, between Edmonton and Saskatoon. Yeah, We're absolutely. The, there. Yeah, Edmonton and Saskatoon have a certain parallel and even as a contrast to Regina and Calgary. Mm -hmm. Like, I think those are the two pairs right there. And I exactly. think, um, yeah, same river, right? For Saskatoon and, and Edmonton, I think. Yeah. Is it the or same the river? Saskatchewan? I think it's the North Saskatchewan. Yeah, yeah, it's the same one. And Edmonton was, the other thing was like, Edmonton was our, that's really where we came up. Like Edmonton was the first place to truly embrace us as us doing original music. Um, and so it was basically like a second hometown in many ways. and lots of our early big shows were there and and that's kind of where we cut our teeth and um 
gained that confidence of, you know, seeing that we could, we could do this thing that, that brought people out and made people enjoy themselves and left them wanting more. So yeah, Edmonton's a, a critical piece for us. We thank you and love Edmonton. I know we've been happy that you've been able to play here as much as you have. So we'll see you more in the future, I'm sure. And it's Absolutely. funny because I was uh, reading the song titles and it's what you want. I was like, is this song about Saskatchewan? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you've heard that before. But Yeah, uh, you, no, not enough people picked up on that. It was uh, a play on this, the words are what you want. Yeah. But it's like when you sing it, it doesn't sound like what you want. It sounds like what you want. Mm -hmm. and and what you want also kind of sounds like saskatchewan so yeah i don't know people didn't no one ever i don't recall anyone ever mentioning it, it feels like it was like an inside joke but i now thought you're that's in what you were, you were going for and uh, we like, were it just we, we thought it missed it, it, <laughs> it missed but you got it thank you um what are some little known secrets about your hometown or about your home province saskatchewan what are some little known secrets about our hometown um even Canadians don't know enough about Saskatchewan. They really don't. I think, I don't know if people know how beautiful Saskatoon is. Like if it's yeah. even in the dead of winter, if you're warm enough, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's a spectacularly beautiful um, river area and they've done really nice things to it. But even if they hadn't, it's just, it's just lovely. Um, and in the winter, it's magical. It's like, you know, when everything gets frozen over, it's such a cool vibe to it. Um, I think people may not know that it has a really strong, um, art scene and that it has really strong local support for that art scene, whether that's music or, um, or visual arts or whatever. It's, there's a very strong presence there um, and a lot of, and a strong will to support local musicians and local artists. Um, what else, you know, there's pretty good coffee you can get in Saskatoon. I think people don't know. There's a, wow. there's a burgeoning, um, uh, foodie scene that's happening there these days if you go to sort of the the kind of the hipster area there's some really good restaurants there now um wow. yeah i think that's that's mostly what people might not know and what's some of your favorite gear to play with for the drummers out there who are interested in uh, oh man the gearheads what do you like to play with? gearheads i mean look i, I i'm i'll sheepishly admit i was a late convert to ludwig but i will play anything ludwig because um, it's pretty cool. I like old Slingerland kits. Um, I like old Gretsch kits. Mm -hmm. um, I also like kind of up and comers that, that make interesting, new, unique things. So there is a guy uh, named Ed Peck out of Regina and he made drums called Epec drums. Mm -hmm. And so I, I met him and I dug his scene and I liked that it was local. So I started playing those. I still have a, a kit that he made for me called Fat Travelers. And it's like a mini kit. It's almost like a jazz kit, but it sounds huge. It's just like really great workmanship and, and precise bearing edges. And like everything is just done very nicely. It's like, it's almost like getting like a nice um, artisanal bread or cheese where, you know, the person who's making it has been has been not only doing it for a long time, but really puts a lot of care and effort and handcrafts that thing. Yeah. With love. With love and with, you know, with, yeah, that, that sort of focus. Um, so yeah, there's that. I used to play drums called Canwood drums. I don't think Canwood's around anymore, but that was a guy uh, out of um, Saskatchewan as well. I think he was near Lloyd Minster, so he was Saskatchewan, Alberta. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, he made the drums like in his barn to start with, you know, so um, I like that. I like the idea of supporting local too, I guess, because I'm from Saskatoon. That leads into what causes do you guys support? What kind of uh, fundraising and such have you done? So we used to um, do charity auctions uh, and our kind of our pet charity was something called SOS Children's Villages, um, which is a really cool international organization um, but it also has a very local sort of feel to it in that it sets up local quote-unquote villages um, mm. that are designed for uh, children in unfortunate circumstances where they don't have parents and they come together in in these houses and have um, a, a mother essentially a, a surrogate or a, a substitute mother I, it's, it's none of those it's actually she becomes their mother and it's someone who herself does not have kids or is not able to have kids or for whatever reason is in that wow. position. And, uh, 
and yeah, it's just really cool. Um, I had a relative, a distant relative of mine who ran one of those in Pakistan. That's where I first heard about it. And then um, once I think Sean had gotten into Johnny Cash a lot and was reading one of his um, biographies and he was really into it too. And it like literally it reaches everywhere in the globe. So that's a really cool one. I personally really like um, MSF, Medicine Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, because they go to places that nobody else does and take huge risks and, and do incredible work in the most trying of circumstances. And you got to think it's like people who, and many of the people there are, the, are doctors, right? So it's like they could be wherever they are, if they're certainly in the sort of Western developed part of the world or more developed part of the world, they, they could be making a whole lot of money, but instead they go and do this thing where they're not making very much money and risking their lives yeah. to help people in the worst possible situation. So that's, that's been a favorite of mine. Um, I tend to, you know, when I look at sort of who's out there doing what, I look at a few factors. I look at sort of what is, what's the vulnerable group that's being targeted what is the history of the organization in terms of what money it spends on overhead and what percentage of the money actually goes to directly to the cause at hand? That's important. Um, A lot yeah, of people don't realize. Know, no, for sure. And that research is out there. You can easily find it. So it's, yeah, I agree with you. It's really important. Check out what's going on and make sure that you're not, you know, if you're going to give, make sure that your most of your money is going to where you're intending it to go. Um, yeah, I think just in general, you know, we, we believe in kind of all the things that, that make sense to believe in, like human rights and equality and social justice um, and ensuring that, you know, as a, as a society, as a civilization, everyone rises, um, not just some people at the top. So that kind of feeds into to who and what we choose to support and get involved in. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Now people can know about some of these causes as well. There's a couple more questions before we wrap this up. I was going to ask you, what album track did you wish would have been a single, a deep cut? Oh, wow. That's such a good question. What album track do I wish would I'm, have been a single? I'm going to play a clip of it. <laughs> I love it. Okay, there is a, I'm actually going to say one from Stu. There is a song called Breathe Out on Stu mm -hmm. that wasn't a single and that I was like, I think this should be a single. No one listened to me. That's okay. Well, they'll listen that to me means. now because I'm going to play a little bit of it. So <laughs> everybody get a chance to hear it as well. Um, just to wrap things up, I wanted to ask you what food or clothing item or toy, anything like that along that lines makes you nostalgic for the 90s? Oh, that's a great question. Um, what makes me nostalgic for the 90s? Well, many things make me nostalgic for the 90s. Um, certain uh the first two versions first three versions of the air jordan sneakers nice. um the uh uh super nintendo <gasps> yes. any game on it um <laughs> and uh cool modi and public enemy Beautiful. and eric b and, and eric b and rakim that's great that's exactly the, the, a good note to uh, wrap up the interview. And I want to tell everybody to check out what my, Wide Mouth Mason is doing now and upcoming. So if you just want to tell us once more, um, what, uh, what are you guys focusing on right now? We released uh, our latest new album uh, at the end of 2019. It's called I Want to Go With You. We will shortly, when we're able to, i.e. when COVID allows us to, go out and tour in support of that album. It's very bluesy. Uh, so the shows will reflect that. We just are re-releasing our album called Stew on vinyl for the first time. It's available now for purchase. It should be uh, manufactured and shipped by November. Great. That's all I got. Thank you so much for your time today. It was a pleasure speaking with you and um, I wish you all the best and all the best to your bandmates and uh, you guys be healthy, be safe. All right. Right back at you. Thank you so much for having me. It really was a pleasure. No problem. And I'll make sure that I tag you guys in all the social media and everything when it's time to put the episode out so that okay, you'll cool. know more about yeah. it. Excellent. Bye. Thank you so much. You bet. All right. Enjoy your afternoon. You too. Bye. Bye.